We are in the 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel, and a lot has happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. Keep, keep in mind, the first two chapters of Luke are birth narratives, of swaddling clothes and all of that. Then there's some ramp up to the adult ministry of Jesus. But then take a look at some of the powerful acts that have happened before the start of chapter 11. Jesus has healed a leper, he's forgiven sins, he's healed a paralyzed man. He's healed a centurion slave, brought back to life the widow's son at Nain, he's calmed a storm, cast out a demon, brought Jairus' daughter back to life. He sponsored lunch for 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And he's healed an epileptic child. Now, I'm not suggesting that the disciples are slow, but by chapter 11, they're starting to put two and two together. Somehow, the magnificent works of healing and power they have figured out are tied to his retreats into prayer. He seemed to pray all the time, not like other folks. His prayer life was different. As Harry Emerson Fosdick says, Jesus prayed as naturally as a child breathes. And with all the walking and teaching and healing and going and doing, Jesus still carves out time, finds place, and prays. And the disciples have now noticed that there is this, that his remarkable power is somehow fueled by these retreats into solitude. Jesus, who would give and heal and restore the humanity around him, would also go away to replenish and refuel in prayer. And so, at the beginning of this chapter, he's at it again. Now, just before this story, he and the disciples had been in the home of Mary and Martha. And you remember that scene. Mary's busy in the kitchen. She's cooking and plating and serving and running around. And Martha's in the den sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's had enough. She comes into the den, slamming around and says to Jesus, Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus tells the overworked and distracted and hurried Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. And then he takes a dose of his own medicine and he retreats himself into prayer. He's away and in my mind the disciples are sitting around the campfire They're waiting for Jesus to get back, and they're now starting to put two and two together. Somehow, this life of power and purpose is tied to these retreats he keeps taking. And so, in today's story, he comes back from one of those prayer retreats, sits down with them around the fire, and one of the disciples says to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. How should I pray? Well, today's the second of a four-part series about the life of prayer. Last week, we looked at the question, why should I pray? Why does it even matter to pray? And so today, we're looking at a second question, and it's the disciples' question, how? How should I pray? As you might guess, there's a rich library of writing on the Lord's Prayer. I had plenty to read this week, in case you were wondering. Some writers, like M.E. Dodd and John Killinger, look at Jesus' prayer life, and they look across the prayer life and mind principles that will help us in ours. Uh, Dr. Killinger's book, for instance, has chapters on the best time for praying, the best place for praying, the best posture for praying, the mood for praying. And if you look at Jesus' life, you can extract those kinds of things. Jesus did set aside certain times for prayer. He had certain places for prayer. 
he went to a certain mountain to pray. He had the habit of going to the garden to pray. All of that's in there. Posture, Jesus knelt in prayer, so forth. So if you're interested in all of that, I've got a great bibliography, I'll pass it off. But today, I want us to just look at this one scene with the disciples. The disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And they noticed that he had this different quality of relationship, this ease, this communion. Teach us to pray. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not br and do not bring us to the time of trial now of course the more popular version of this prayer is found in Matthew that's the version we all said together it's what we memorized but the disciples have surely noticed that Jesus prayer life was not like everybody else's other people just kind of recited the Jewish prayers. It was rote, but not Jesus. He had relationship. He went away and desired to reconnect. And they wanted to understand how this nurture, how to nurture this communion with the Father. So this model prayer was a way of teaching the disciples an honest model for grappling with their inner world, to remove from the remote, the, the rote prayers that they knew, and to think in a very personal way about how to foster this kind of relationship. Elton Trueblood points out the irony that's happened since. He said, how sad that Christ's very attempt to help men escape from meaningless rote should sometimes become meaningless rote. That is, this model for an honest communing prayer has become for some people just another something to recite. But this model for prayer is a kind of outline for thinking about some of the components that an honest prayer might include. If you break it down, if you look, lean over, look real closely at it, you'll begin to see how layered and deep and powerful. For instance, just, just consider the opening. Father, hallowed be your name. There's five words in English. But listen to what all is packed into those five words. Jesus begins with two images that don't really go together. Father, uh, Abba, Daddy. It, it, it's a tender, intimate word that suggests relationship that's close and near and sweet. And then that's followed immediately by hallowed, which means awe and respect and revered and sacred. In five words, Jesus is already modeled by saying the prayer life is both close and tender, and it's awe-striking. How grand and awe-inspiring and wonderful and holy are you, and I fall to my knees in the presence of your grandeur, Daddy. Do you see? Your kingdom come. We pray that God's good and just reign in the world might be realized. Give us each day our daily bread. This day's needs give us enough. We tend to camp out on this one. I bet two-thirds of most of our prayer life is just this one. Give us some of this and give us this and dear God give us this and then maybe throw in a Maserati and then give us this. But we pray for enough. And forgive us our sins 
In this audacious relationship with a parent who loves us and with the all-powerful God who can, we ask to be made clean, forgiven of all of our wrongdoing. We are unworthy of having our debts forgiven, but in our forgiveness we pray that we might have the grace to also forgive the wrongdoings of others. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. We pray to be protected from the things that tempt us. The things that tempt us to our lesser self and move us out of the stream of God's great, ten, great kingdom purpose. Jesus said pray like that. I know some people who literally model their daily prayer after that prayer. They start every prayer affirming the audacious relationship, our Father. Then, hallowed be thy name. They, they spend some time just offering praise to God. And they just kind of work their way one line at a time all the way through the prayer. You could do, you could do a lot worse. How long should you pray? <laughs> there was a former pastor of the United Methodist Church in Houston who said he could pray sufficiently in five, ten minutes. He said, it's kind of like the guy who goes to the bank to cash a check. Once your, bank, your, once your check's cash, you don't need to stick around the bank any longer. Just didn't do. Jesus' answer was a little bit different from that. When he was asked, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus taught the model prayer that we've just talked about, but then he told this parable. If any of you has a friend, goes to him in the middle of the night, says, lend me three loaves, my dear fellow, for a friend of mine's just arrived for a journey, I have no food to put in front of him. And he answers from inside the house, don't bother me with your troubles. Front door's locked, my children and I have gone to bed. I simply cannot get up now and give you anything. Yet I tell you that even if he won't get up and give him what he wants simply because he's his friend, yet if he persists, he will rouse himself, give him everything he needs. So I tell you, ask and it will be given. Search and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. We pray, we pray, we pray, and then we pray some more. We don't just cash the check and leave. We pray. As Walter Wink said, biblical prayer is impertinent, persistent, shameless, indecorous. It's more like haggling in an outdoor bazaar than the polite monologues of the church. We just keep at it and keep at it. Last week I told a Mother Teresa story. I've got another one for this week. The story is that one day Mother Teresa came to see Edward Bennett Williams. Some of you might know that name. Uh, a rather a famous attorney uh, from Washington, D.C., who was also at one time owner of the Washington Redskins football team, and, and he was also owner of the Baltimore Orioles baseball team. But anyway, she came to see him in his capacity as chairman of, of a foundation that gave to church-related institutions. She'd come to solicit a contribution for a hospital that she was raising money to build uh, for, uh, for AIDS sufferers. But when she finished the proposal, the proposal was the kind of uh, project that the foundation did not generally give money to. It was beyond the bounds of the foundation's uh, primary mission. And so, so Mr. Williams just had to tell her, no, we, this is not the kind of thing we fund. She stressed the importance of it, the need for it. She kept making her appeal. He said, no. So Mother Teresa said, let us pray. She folded her hands, began praying, then she made the presentation a second time and this time asked for more money 
than she did the first time. And again, William said no. And she said, let us pray. After she prayed the next time, she made the pitch another time and asked for more money than she had the first two times. And again, Williams, this hardened businessman, said, no. Mother Teresa said, let us pray. (laughs) Finally, he said, okay, 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 give me the checkbook. He had been beaten down. How should you pray? Like that. Doggedly and honestly. We are in relationship with the hallowed one who also happens to be a loving parent. So just be honest and keep at it. Keep at it. And worry less about whether or not you're doing it right. Just do it. Do more of it. Sit alone listening in the presence of God until you are restored and replenished and ready for what's next. Elton Trueblood says, in so far as we try to imitate the life of Christ, we need to be reminded that the quality of service depends primarily upon what we have to offer and that we do not have enough to offer when we're always offering. So just as Jesus retreated to refuel and replenish, If we don't do the same, we're going to dry up and have nothing to offer at all. The disciples had noticed that much of Jesus' purpose and focus and remarkable power were somehow tied to the times he went away and nurtured his inner world. And that life of prayer filled him up in a way that he could live out his grand purpose in the world. So if you are not experiencing life as just bubbling over with focus and power and purpose, let me commend to you a more disciplined life of prayer. It is in the time sitting alone with the holy creator of the universe that our inner life expands, that we take nurture, nourishment and healing, we come to find again our place in the world. This table is also a filling station of sorts. It's another kind of occasion for us to step back from the chaos of our living and reflect, pray, to ask God to enter into the sacred space we're trying to create and to challenge us in a new way, to bless us in a new way, to help us reclaim our purpose and our focus, our part in what God is trying to do in the world. And somehow in the power of these elements, bread and cup, we experience forgiveness, renewal, clarity, purpose, the kinds of things Jesus experienced in retreat, an opportunity to sit again with the holy parent and ask that our witness be reclaimed. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, said, This is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. O oh God, in these moments of reflection, we offer ourselves to you. We call you hallowed and holy. We tremble before your presence. And still we give thanks that you are the holy parent who loves us, who wants what's best for us. So we pray that you might provide all that we need. We continue to do wrong. Keep us from the things that tempt us as we offer our confession for the ways we failed you again. And by the power of this table, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Help us reclaim our purpose here to recommit ourselves to our place in thy kingdom come. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the bread of life.
This is the cup of salvation. And now by the power of this table and Christ's love, you have been healed and forgiven. How will you respond to a grace that big and a beckoning love that moves you forward? We're going to stand and sing in a moment, but your prayer may continue as we're singing, listen for the sound of God's voice and be bold enough to respond with a yes. Let's stand and sing and pray together. 